Our gospel reading today comes to us from the book of Luke, the 17th chapter. I invite you to read along either, uh, well, on the screen or in your pew Bibles. And listen now for the word of the Lord. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten lepers approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, were not ten made clean? But the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except for this foreigner? Then he said to him, get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So this week, as I had a few moments, I was continuing to empty or boxes full of files and books and sort through some of them anyway and move the furniture around in the pastor study a little bit and found myself um, thinking about how time passes uh, that this time a year ago I was just a few weeks into uh, teaching high school English students and I was thinking of the song you know you you are young and life is long and there is time to kill today and then one day you find ten years have got behind you no one told you when to run, you missed the starting gun. Time passes rapidly. Maybe for us it's 10 years or 20 years or 50 years or 70 years, but time does go by quickly, doesn't it? And last year I was made very aware by how quickly time passes as a high school teacher uh, with a bell schedule. We had a bell to mark every 52 minutes of our day. And it was a, a curious thing to observe that and to feel um, a, a bit of joy and relief when that bell went off and to know I had a few minutes to catch my breath and know that that was one last period I had to teach before the end of the day. But also in the back of my mind to feel a little, well, to feel an awareness that was also 52 minutes less I had with these students to try to encourage them to, in, in, in their quest to, to, to learn and, to, and to, to be young men and women of character, hopefully. It was 52 minutes less I had in this life. I think there is a desperation about time. We often don't admit it, but when we think about it, and we think about how much time has passed, we might become aware of it. In our society, we, we rush through life to get as much out of our time as possible. And because we're so busy, we're not even aware that we're doing it. I remember seeing a sign in front of a church. I, I always find it entertaining to read the signs in front of churches. This one was good. It had the word busy. And then it's spelled out, the words busy, uh, busy means being under Satan's yoke. And I think there's some truth to that. It's in those moments when we stop and we realize how busy we've been and we wonder how the time could go by so quickly. I remember seeing a bumper sticker once that said, life's a race and you just got lapped. And I think we all feel that way from time to time. It's not true, by the way. Life's not a race. We, we know the author of time, and God did not set up our lives to be that way. But we've let it. So many of us have let it become that way, haven't we? 
And we in our society tend to reward people who live fast by giving them the means to live faster. You ever notice that? Those who live fast, we give them the tools and the gadgets to live even quicker lives. And things of convenience become just an excuse to do more work. Years ago, people mused over how much recreation time we'd have by now. How much free time we'd all have when things like you know, washing machines and dishwashers and vacuum cleaners would make our lives so easy. And we'd just lay back and let the machines do all the work for us while we relax. What the machines have done, in many ways, has sped life up and required more from each of us in our lives. We're overburdened by the speed of life in so many ways. So today I want to talk to you about time. There are a couple of approaches to time we see in our society that I, I want to share with you or point out to you. One of those is the carpe diem approach. You've probably heard that, carpe diem, seize the day. It's a wonderful idea. The idea is this, life is short and so let's get the most out of it. We don't have much time, so we're going we're gonna to grab life with both hands and just wring as much out of our time as we can get, right? Enjoy every moment. Make the best of it. And Seize the Day is great in a lot of ways. It encourages and inspires us to, to get more out of our lives. I can think of some of the moments in my, lives that, in my life that stand out that are kind of the product of Seize the Day, standing on top of, of mountains, crossing finish lines, spending time with my wife and children, it's great stuff. But if we think about seize the day, and if we let it run to its logical conclusion, we might come to realize that carpe diem is really just about me. Hear me out. If I'm seizing the day, I'm seeking out the things that are about me. My life, my hopes, my dreams, my goals, my bucket list, if you will, whatever it is, sees the day is good, but it seems to me it has a limitation. Where's room for God? Where's room for neighbor? Where's room for church? So if sees the day is inspiring, but maybe falls a little short of what we're aiming at, maybe the second approach will be better. There's another common approach to time. This is very common in Christian circles these days. It's, it's, it's what I call the obligation or responsibility mindset. And, and the idea is this. Life is a proving ground. Have you thought about it this way? You, you probably have, or you've been encouraged to think about it this way. You see, we're, we're given so much time here on earth, and if we use it well, thinking about other people, helping other people, going to church, being a good church member, then maybe God will give us more time in eternity in heaven, right? So the idea is, we have to live out our lives being responsible, being caring, being all those good things that we encourage one another to be and to do. But there's a limit to that too. See, I can think of a few people who Jesus met and talked about who had that mindset, who were miserable people. You remember the prodigal son, right? You remember the prodigal son had an older brother? Was the older brother a nice guy? Eh. He was a responsible son, wasn't he? He, he, did, he fulfilled his father's wishes. He did what was asked of him. But was he happy when the younger brother came home? No, he wasn't, was he? He was, he was resentful. I've been here, Dad, all this time. I've been the good son. I've done everything you've asked me to do, and you've never thrown a party for me. He was the responsible one. What kind of place, what kind of mindset did that take him to? I also think of Mary and Martha. You know the story of Mary and Martha. We know the story of Mary and Martha. They're gathered. Jesus is with them in their home, and, 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 and they're all sitting around Jesus. Even Mary's sitting with Jesus. She's sitting at his feet, and she, they're just enjoying everyone's company, and Jesus is teaching them and talking to them and enjoying them. But Martha's in the back, right? And Martha's cleaning up after dinner or whatever, and she comes out and she says, Jesus, I'm back here doing the dishes. Send Mary to help me. 
you remember what Jesus said? He was, he was upset. He said that you have chosen your path. She has chosen hers. She is worshiping at, at my feet. She has chosen the better part. Fulfilling responsibility is as good. Please don't hear me say that we should be careless or we should care about other people or we should be responsible. But if we spend our time doing that, if we spend our time thinking about being responsible, being the, the, the good son, the good daughter, the good church member, we might miss something. We might miss in trying to prove ourselves to God or in trying to earn life with God, forgiveness with God for eternity. We might forget God's already given us that. See, we can't earn something that's been freely given, and we can't repay God for what God never just, just wanted us to freely take. But we see people who live that way, don't we? We see people who live that way and, 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 and where that mindset can take us. We certainly see it in Scripture. So if seize the day falls a little short and, 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 and that responsibility or obligation mindset kind of falls short, where are we left? How do we think about time as Christians today? At a point in our history where thinking about time may be as important as ever. Well, there's a third option. And we see it in the Gospel of Luke. This passage is very much about time. Jesus heals 10 lepers. Well, actually what he does is he sends them to the priest. Now, you have to understand, maybe you already know this, but back in those days, if you were ritually unclean, which lepers were, and you were healed, you had to go to the priest to be recognized as being clean. Even if you were healed physically, you weren't recognized as clean by society until a priest said so. Also, you could not approach a priest if you were unclean. So when Jesus tells the lepers to go and see the priest, there's only one reason he could have for giving them that command. And all ten of them go. Isn't that amazing? All ten of them, they believe, they have faith. Something else happens. Something very interesting happens. One of them comes back. One of them. All ten of them go. All ten of them get to the priest. But one of them, when he's healed on the way, realizes what's happened, and he comes back, and he, and he bows down at Jesus' feet, and he praises him, and he worships him, and he tells him, thank you. Jesus asks the question of questions. Where are the other nine? If we think about it, we know the answer to that. First of all, they're fulfilling their religious obligation. They've been made clean. Their first duty is to report to the priest. They're being good Jews. But we know what else they're doing, don't we? If you'd spent years, maybe your entire life, missing out on life while everybody around you lived and you're on the outskirts, on the border of town, watching all the pleasures of life, watching all the things that people get to do when they're regular people and you're not regular people, and you get to do that, you would seize the day, wouldn't you? You'd start living. You'd get right to it. Time's a-wasting, and look at all the years you've wasted being sick. One of them gets it. Time is wasted. Time to worship at the feet of the living Lord Jesus Christ, God in flesh, is wasting. And he goes back. He goes back. He doesn't miss it. He's not stuck in obligation or responsibility. He's not simply wishing to seize the day and thinking of himself. He goes back to worship Jesus. So here's the thing. We can live our lives desperately trying to get everything we can out of it. 
Or we can live our life just trying to earn or repay something that's been freely given to us that we could never repay in an eternity anyway. Or we can recognize that in Jesus Christ, eternity begins right now. Did you hear that? Eternity begins now, right where you are. It's not something we get to when we die. It's something now that in Christ we live forever with God. And in this part of things, we get to bring in the kingdom of God. And then in the next, we get to live in it gloriously forever. We can live like Mary at the feet of Christ. We can live like the one leper who returned, recognizing who Jesus truly was and giving thanks and praise for him. We can live a life of power and abundance, a life where every day is seized and every promise is fulfilled because we'll be at the feet of the one who makes the broken whole, who makes the sick to be healthy, the empty full, the sinner a saint, the dead alive, the lost found, the hungry fed, and the blind able to see, the helpless and hopeless full of hope and promise. You'll be seizing the day because you'll be with the one who made day and night. And you'll be pleasing to God. You'll be fulfilling your obligations and responsibilities to, lo to the Lord because you'll be at the feet of the one who fulfilled all God's promises for us. So, okay. All right, I want to live at the feet of Jesus, you might be thinking. What does that look like? Well, I'm glad you asked. My wife, uh, a short while ago, had the occasion to, to visit with a woman she had met, and, and, and she wanted to help her out, so we, we prayed that in her visit it would be, it would be helpful to this woman. And, and through that, we ended up ourselves being served in a way we never expected. My wife went over to this woman's home and was, and, and was helping her, and, and she came home, and she says, Mike, I want you to look at the van. And I thought, oh, goodness. I'm thinking there's a, there's a dent in it, there's a ding in it, you know, the mirror's hanging. What, what's going on here? Somebody bump into you, something. Well, I go out there, and, and even in the garage, we, we have a white minivan. It's, it's blinding me with its brilliance. See, while my wife was at this woman's home, her husband had been washing his own car. And he came and got my wife's keys under the, the, the well, the, the ruse was that he was moving our van so that he could get something out. But in the process, he washed our van. He washed our van. This was uh, about, I don't know, a few months ago. It was in the springtime. Last year was a blur. You have to understand, we were both teaching. So from about August until whenever this was in the spring, we had not washed our van. He washed our van. And so I go to open it, and I find that he had vacuumed our van. We have three children. We hadn't vacuumed the van in like eight months. I have no idea what was in there. Were French fries, probably with colonies of ants or something. And he vacuumed our van. We didn't, he, my wife didn't know he was doing this. But what an amazing use of time. I mean, you, you can just see somebody doing this, right? They're, they're not washing the van going, oh, this stinks. Why am I doing this? I, I, why am I doing this? This is such a waste of time. If, if he didn't want to do it, he, couldn't, he didn't have to do it. He wasn't obligated. We weren't expecting him to watch, wash our van. Actually, I kind of imagined him giggling while he was doing it, like he was doing something naughty, right? Except, except he was doing something good. That kind of joy. That's what it's like, I think, to... I'm sure that's what it's like to be at the feet of Jesus, just full of joy. You just can't help but giggle. And share that joy with others. Maybe it's through washing a van. Maybe it's through serving a meal. Maybe it's just through sitting down and listening to somebody. Maybe it's through praying for somebody. Not out of obligation, not trying to repay God, not trying to prove yourself. But just sharing what God shared with you.
You see, it's different. It's a different way to think about time than seizing the day or, or living out our responsibilities. It's living at the feet of Jesus. And I think it looks a little bit like that. And so I challenge you, find ways. Find, find little cons conspiracy ways that you can live out that love. Conspire to share that joy. And if you do, you lay down each night and you'll say, you know, day seized, promise Christ fulfilled. Today was a good day. Time well spent. Amen.